ACNFers. I have a teensy bit more time on my hands. That could be changing. Who knows? If you leave a review over at Apple Podcasts, I'll give you a complimentary edit of a piece of your writing up to 2,000 words. Once your review posts, usually within 24 hours, send me a screenshot of that review to Creative Nonfiction Podcast at gmail.com, and I'll reach back out and we'll get started. Who knows? If you like the experience, you might want me to help you with something a bit more ambitious. Making sure you stop to feel satisfied. Like like people could have gratitude practice, but this was like a satisfaction practice. Like, okay, good job. Like you have to like manufacture the positive feedback for yourself so that it makes it easier to get up and do it again tomorrow. ACNFers, it's CNF Pod, that creative nonfiction podcast, a show where I speak to badass people about telling true stories. I am Brendan O'Mara. How's it going? Today's guest, ooh, it's a good one, fast one, super fast, like the wind, CNFers, Lauren Fleshman, the author of Good for a Girl, A Woman Running in a Man's World. It is published by Penguin Press. Hell of a book, CNFers, hell of a book. An important book, especially if maybe you're a parent of a young female athlete, specifically a runner. Lauren was a five-time NCAA champion at Stanford University, wicked smart, Harvard of the West, and two-time national champion as a professional. Her book chronicles her rise as a young phenom and the trials and tribulation in the toxic world women runners are subjected to based on the male standard. Women face a whole different set of pressures and athletic peaks based on their own unique biology, where puberty and periods and hips and breasts are often called injuries. Lauren creates space for a new conversation that might just move the standard for women athletes so they might have a less physically and mentally toxic experience on and off the track. We're talking disordered eating, missed periods, you you, you name it, it the whole that, that that whole world is 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 broken and Lauren is out to fix it and it wouldn't be a CNF pod experience if we didn't talk about the challenges of writing the book something that Lauren hasn't spoken much about in her media blitz for this now New York Times bestseller we talk about how running is a writer's sport and how writing is a runner's art how she handled a particularly dark time in her life following a uh, possibly career into injury, writing about hard stuff, and why she's scared when she sees the next young phenom runner. See Mary Kane. Google Mary Kane and you will you will know. Juicy conversation, guys. One last thing. Head over to brendanamera.com hey, hey, for show notes and to sign up for my up to 11 Rage Against the Algorithm newsletter. Lots of cool stuff, goodies, raffles, happy hours. Shout out to Lori and Andrew. First of the month, no spam. As far as I can tell, you can't beat it. There's also Patreon if you want to check that out. I won't belabor the point. See uh, patreon.com slash cnfbot. And I'm just going to get right into it. Okay, CNFers? This is Lauren Fleshman you're about to hear from. All right? It's been a, it's like a lot more than I expected. Um, yeah, it's been great. I mean, it's, I don't know how common this is or if it's just the way my brain works, but I've pretty much, I spent a lot of time convincing myself that the book made no sense and people who read it early and said nice things were just being nice to me. <laughs> it's like really hard for me to be convinced that the book accomplished what I set out to do and that people are actually enjoying it. <laughs> so yeah. I think it's finally sinking in that at least some people are being honest when they say that. So that's nice. For sure. And what about the book did you feel made no sense? I think it was just like, the main thing was that I made it all up somehow, which is what a lot of women who are reading it in their 30s, 40s, and 50s are writing to me. They're like, wow, seeing you write those feelings and thoughts and experiences, like the undercurrent things, the unspokens, they were like, I had sort of convinced myself I had made that up 
because no mm. one was talking about it plainly with each other. And you get enough distance from it and you, you start to kind of doubt, like, was there as much implied pressure as I thought to change my body or, or was that just me, you know, being sensitive or whatever? That, that's been nice to, to see. It's just like, oh yeah, no, I, <laughs> that was real. <laughs> and taking yeah. a huge risk on vocalizing that, those inner monologues was like, oh boy. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh it's it strikes me that that writing is kind of a runner's art and that you know, running is kind of a writer's sport. So for you like what is your relationship to running and writing and you know sort of how they tie together, I think. Specific to this book, so much of what this book's about, the themes, the like little moments that and scenes that stuck out that I felt compelled to write about are things that I've processed on runs or talked about or around with people on runs. Like, cause not only is a run when you're, when you're alone running is this place where you can work things out right in your mind and your mind can hop freely around what seems like unrelated subjects as you're moving through space, you just kind of ping pong around, but really you're, I think it's like dreaming and that your brain is trying to solve things and it's, uniquely able to pull from what seems like unrelated categories in order to figure stuff out. It's difficult to process. And I think running alone can put you in that space too, but running with others, there's an openness to the kind of communication that you do on a run that's so different from sitting across the table from one another. So that was a huge, that running played a huge role in just formulating the book and what needed to be said and where the problems were. I think maybe only baseball is the only other sport that rivals running in terms of the volume of uh, things that have been written about it in a sense, especially in the book space. Uh, Mm. So for you, what were some potential models or even just favorite books on running that, that you, that, that light you up and might've even given you the inspiration to, you know, write your own and contribute to it in your own way? Well, I read very few sports books, but um, I'd say, let Your Mind Run, Dina Castor and Michelle Hamilton's book was a big one for me. Um, Running While Black I read after I'd already written my book, but that's one that has influenced me a lot. I think our books rhyme, Alison Desir's book and mine rhyme and the way we approached it. Um, but like Seabiscuit is an example of a book of it's horses running, it's horse racing. Mm-hmm. But that influenced me a lot. I'm trying to think if there were any other running books specifically. Like I read The Perfect Mile I liked that. Um, but I think, yeah, overall, I've I've had a hard time connecting with running books. So I prefer stories about uh, like worlds that I don't know. Yeah. Is that because you have such a intimate connection to running just to have, with all your successes and having done it for so long that when you read about it, that there are certain things that maybe the writer who doesn't have quite your experience doesn't quite stick the landing. You're like, yeah, it's just not quite there. Yeah. I think that it's, it's mostly about um, the thrill of learning something new. Mm-hmm. And so I think lots of writers, they, 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 I'm sure sometimes it's cause they don't stick the landing, but sometimes they do stick a landing. It's just like, I've already stuck that landing in my mind or I'm not, it's yeah. not, there's nothing novel or surprising about it to me. Um, so it's just, I've spent, 30 years of my life so deeply engrossed in that world that it's tough to surprise me at this point. I love in the acknowledgments of the book too, when, when you're writing about Jennifer Loudon and she, how she helped you recover from the devastating realization that you weren't Ann Patchett about halfway (laughs) through your first draft. So maybe just to kind of talk about that dynamic and also the, the doubt that comes across when you're trying to accomplish something and you're like, Oh my God, this just isn't manifesting in the way that, in my head, I see it coming together. Oh, yeah. Well, it's crazy because previous to this book, I've only written essays, blogs, that kind of thing. And the 800 to 1600 word experience of trying to take your grand idea and humbly patch it together with words in an order is always frustrating, but it's only frustrating for like a limited amount of time. But in a long form, I mean, you're just in that place of frustration for so much longer and there's so much more room for doubt that you'll ever be able to pull it off, that it will even remotely resemble what you have in mind because the longer form gives you so many more possibilities 
the like potential for weaving together themes and narr- and overlapping narrative arc. I mean, you can just do so much more, but yeah, then you're the space between what you think you can do and what your skill set is can be far apart. And then it also can take three, four, five or more drafts before it starts to remotely resemble your thoughts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so that's just so much work, like a lot of time with the inner critic without positive reinforcement. Oh, absolutely. When you had started your, your blog and, and social media accounts, kind of in the heyday of when that stuff could really gain traction where, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you could really kind of glom on and, and, and get an audience. You could, you could write a missive and then you could tell if it was resonating with your audience in a way that like kind of put fuel in your take was fairly instantaneous. But with a, with a book, it's kind of like you're alone with it for so long and you just don't know if it's going to come together. And like you said, it can take, it can take so long. And then, yeah, you, you just don't necessarily know you know, how, how it's coming together. It's unlike a blog oh. post or something. Yeah. And as a runner, like you, you, you hit it like totally right on with the blogging, you get in pretty much instant feedback. Um, and as a runner, you, I was used to that as well. Like you can just go out and time a run. You can go do a race every weekend. You can push yourself on a certain kind of interval session that you are familiar with and get an accurate gauge of where you're at. And then, and that's just for yourself. And you can also, if you have a social media presence, just put out something to get some sort of reaction. <laughs> like mm-hmm. if you need to feel like you're in community. But um, but yeah, I think that that being alone with myself, it really highlighted where my insecurities still are. And I'm a human like everybody else. I mean, I know we all have, we all have that, but I didn't have a lot of practice sitting with that feeling for a very long time. And then having to do that during the pandemic um, and during lockdown and it, a lot of other things sort of fed the insecurity side of the fire. Yeah. And that's something I love talking about on this show, just as, as writers, because sometimes it's what, what sometimes what we feel, but we don't necessarily articulate, especially those feelings when we're alone and doing these things uh, on our own in our own offices or retreats or wherever, wherever we might be about yeah you know, how hard it is to do it and f- feeling like everybody else is really, really good. And like, here we are stewing in our own garbage. And yeah. so, for, so for you, how did your insecurities as a, as a writer manifest? Oh gosh. Um, so many ways. This is such a hard question. <laughs> how did it manifest? I mean, I would just, I would just avoid doing the work. That was the biggest way that it affected me. I would find any yeah. excuse not to do it. I had to, play games with myself to convince myself to take the small steps one at a time. Right. Like it felt like I was building this big Lego creation. You know, I got, I got young kids, so Legos are top of mind. So I'm building this huge Lego creation and I had to find a way to get myself excited about a random two by two brick that I successfully placed on one side of the castle. Right. Because if you can't find a way to, generate some sort of positive energy in your body when you are making progress, then it's just like this end, it becomes this endless march into who knows what. Um, And so I would, I made a lot of my, my book coach, Jen Loudon, who you mentioned earlier, she has some really great frameworks for that of just like practicing satisfaction and making sure that you're measuring satisfaction by things that are measurable and realistic And then, and so that you're spending less time asking myself the question, am I accomplishing what my imagination thinks I can do here? Is this book going to work? And instead spending as many days as I can going, did I sit down in the chair for two hours before I took a break? Or did I write this many words today? And, and then the last step is making sure you stop to feel satisfied like people could have gratitude practice, but this was like a satisfaction practice. Like, okay, good job. Like you have to like manufacture the positive feedback for yourself so that it makes it easier to get up and do it again tomorrow. Well, it's gotta be, you know, for, for, for a runner too, it's, it can be those points of satisfaction are pretty concrete, you know, be it just how you check in with your body, but also just looking at the stopwatch, be like, Mm -hmm. okay, well that is objectively, uh, feedback that you can either be satisfied or dissatisfied with. So 
just you know flipping that over to the writer side of things how did you measure satisfaction so it was something like looking at the stopwatch and be like okay mm-hmm. that, that was a good lap yeah i think i just time and words mm-hmm. so if i if i successfully wrote for a certain amount of time before breaks if i wrote a certain number of words then i would i, I treated that as miles and pace even though miles and pace are more universally understood as satisfying in it of themselves. Like you do a five mile run, like that's satisfying no matter what you're training for or not training for. I did have to train myself to just think it was satisfying to write 1500 words, even if those words sucked because they were all in service of getting to the better words later. They had like, there was, I think there was this acceptance of like, I'm just going to have to write a lot of garbage here. I really didn't know how much of my book would just get thrown away when I was sitting down to write a book for the first time. Like that was, that would be so much better the next time around. It would take a lot of pressure off finding the perfect words or the right words. If I just knew that I would essentially write four books worth of words and I would keep one book worth of words in the end. What I liked about uh, the, you know, the, some of the, the the book as well too, is how you kind of like folding in, uh, you know, elements of, of family that really kind of, you know, are an undercurrent of the, of the thing. And then, you know, there's a moment early on where you said there's a, a shelf above your dad's bar that w- your sister called the Lauren shrine as, as she mm-hmm. fought for real estate with softball awards as a, you know, a symbol of your sibling dynamic. So, uh, and that she hasn't fully recovered from. So I imagine like by now, is it, is this still a point of contention with your sister? <laughs> yeah, I think that we're older now, right? I'm 41. She's 38. But there were so many years of our relationship shaped by that childhood dynamic of comparison, of trying to win our dad's approval through um, achievement and her, you know, there's always like, or not always, younger sibling conflict with older sibling is really common and being compared to the older sibling and stuff. That happens a lot. A lot of my friends have experienced that on one side or the other, but then, um, uh, it's really like how many years went by after that without a lot of positive things to build your relationship on. And we went to school in different places. We never really lived in the same city for any significant period of time. I was working this at- job as a professional athlete, traveling and racing in the around, around the world and wasn't putting any energy into my relationship with my sister. Like I just didn't prioritize it. Um, and so at our ages now, we still have a like this, we just don't have much built on top of the childhood dynamic and that's what we're working on now. So yeah, it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of tough, what was, what did you find more challenging in this book? Like writing about intimate details of, you know, what you chose to share with your family or intimate details with yourself in your running career? I think the toughest thing was sharing details about my teammates and my coaches because that ties back to what we were talking about earlier with all the unspoken things where there were these words a coach might say with, with very little thought as to how much weight they carried. And then they forgot about it five minutes later, but the room full of athletes remembered it for the rest of their lives. Um, and like, that's the power a coach can have or a parent can have, right? When you have that power dynamic. Some of the things that were said or um, the the societal norms and pressures placed on our team didn't affect me as much as my teammates did, were affected. But I needed to tell those stories of how they can affect people because they do affect so many people. So I was essentially telling other people's stories instead of my own, which is always uncomfortable. And then I love my coaches. I don't want to make anybody look bad and I don't think anybody's a bad person. And so, but I had to find a way to tell those stories if I wanted things to change. So I think that that was really hard. It's still hard. Like I still feel mm. deeply uncomfortable with having done that. You know, I like ended up making this bargain with myself where I really wrestled with each story and said, does this need to be in there? Does it serve a purpose? Am I being fair? Am I painting a complete picture of this person and not just a caricature um, the best that I can in the space allowed, right? And then like, am I willing to disappoint people? Yeah, that yeah. that surprises me because you know you're you're very candid about your father's alcoholism and how even though you he was very proud of you you know super and super supportive in terms of your you know in your sports and you know when you made the team as a freshman you're like yeah there's Fleshman the freshman mm-hmm. and everything and you know you could just hear him cheering for you it, but there was this, a very un 
comfortable domestic component to to your story too which i mm-hmm. it, so it just surprised me that like that was like the track stuff and teammates and coaches that yeah. that was more uncomfortable for you well it was all really uncomfortable um yeah. but the, if my dad was still living it would be it would have been impossible to write the book and so mm-hmm. i think that yeah his death 7 years ago and the amount of grieving and processing that I've done in the years since I feel the most, I feel more confident that the story I told about my dad is my story, even though it's him too. Like it, because it was so critical to understanding the person I turned out to be and the lens with which I view the world and the sensitivities I brought to every room after that, that I, like, even if he were alive, I feel like it would have been harder to write the book, but I do feel like I could have had a conversation with him about it. I don't know that all of those pieces would have been in the book um, that are in there now, Mm -hmm. but yeah. And as you start to progress and you know, you have a a certain, uh, a a certain skill um, for, for running, like at at what point does, you know, the switch turn on and you're like, Oh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at this. And I, you know, it's in people like coach DeLong start, really encouraging you to pursue this competitively? Yeah, well, I think when I was discovering I had aptitude for it, I I was pretty good at most physical things I tried as a kid. Like I just that that was my gift. I could learn a physical task. My body had this physical intelligence that would learn things quickly. And so um, I wasn't surprised when I was good at running. And it took a while for me being good at running to then flip some switch to like, oh, um, I now feel pressure or I now I'm doing this for some other reason than just the thrill of doing it. Because like winning or placing near the top was still part of just the thrill of doing it at first, for, for the first few years. It's when those economic forces start to get tangled up with it. Like, oh, running could be a pathway to free college education, which could change the entire course of your life. Like that's when it gets a little complicated. Yeah, there's a moment to it. This is, you know, as you as you're starting to progress and you're noticing, you're starting to get hit in the face with the 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 different dynamics between, you know, men's and women's running, and you're fully immersed in it. And there's a point where you write too, you know, with the men they were focusing on battling the competition, but and, and then you write like we were spent so much, we spent so much competitive energy battling ourselves. So maybe you can kind of take us into that and that and unpack that sentence a bit. Yeah, for sure. I think that um, because the sports system was designed around, you know, high school and college sports system around the 13 to 22 year old male body and women and girls were actively excluded until 50 years ago from participating in any meaningful way. There's just a lot of things we take for granted that should apply to everyone like you, that, like all these sports sayings of you get out what you put into sports, right? Effort equals results. Like you, if you train harder, you get better. And those comments are relatively true most of the time for male athletes, barring injury or illness, but for female athletes going through development during those ages, that's just not the normal experience that there's, it's way, way, way more common to improve for a while. Then your body changes. And then you have this period of time where you're having to adjust to your new body, to like breasts, hips, higher body fat percentage, your strength to weight rate, strength to weight ratio changes in what is at first an unfavorable direction, but then after a couple of years becomes favorable again. And then we can enjoy a second rise that lasts well into our 20s, 30s, and even 40s. But during those critical years where we're having a different experience than the male bodied people around us, we aren't in a sports system that meets that, meets you where you're at and like helps you see that that's normal and encourages you to lean into your new body changes and development. Instead, we treat it as a deviation from what's the, you know, the definition of excellent. And we tell girls they're being uncommitted if they, if they gain body fat or we criticize their diet or we try to restrict their diet. Um, Coaches try to control women's bodies through mandatory weigh-ins and body fat testing and things during this age when like they shouldn't even be paying attention to that at all because so their bodies are just taking the form that they're meant to take and so because of that conflict between what's happening in the female body and the environments that we're in that don't respect what's happening in the female body we spend a lot of energy battling ourselves and um, we assume there's something wrong with us 
and watching my male peers have this freedom to have the, have a body that matched the expectation around them that could work harder and get better, right? Like fairly predictably was tough. Um, it just, we, a lot of the, the next stage for the female athletes, like you get into that place of battling yourself. You, you can get pretty deep into disordered eating and anxiety, just thinking negatively about yourself, your confidence taking a hit. So it's like, you're fighting just to try to have any semblance of confidence on the starting line through tumult. And I, I think that that sentence you read, it, that's what the heart of that was. And I think in terms of disordered eating too, when you come into, uh, when you start phrasing the the sentence around it, developing an eating disorder, and if we kind of like split hairs on the, on the, on the wording there, you know, that developing is such a, such a key thing. It's not some, it's not a cute, it's not all of us, it, but it is, it is kind of like a slow development. It might start easy. You might be cutting something here and then it's like, well, I can cut a little more. And maybe you can speak to that and how you can how you experienced it and how your your teammates experience it as this like this slow insidious thing that eventually turns into something completely toxic. Yeah, well, eating disorders can come on a lot of different ways, and people experience them a lot of different ways. Um, the mo- the most common experience that I I highlight in the book is one of like a, a gradual progression toward like of becoming more and more disordered to um, a point where you, you end up losing control. And it starts, it, the, the problem is there's, there's like this Venn diagram of overlap between what can lead to an eating disorder, like eating di- disorder risk behaviors and high achieving athlete. So like if you are very disciplined and you have, you're kind of perfectionistic, um, driven, um, people pleasing, these are things, these are four qualities that can be like a boon as an athlete, right? It makes you coachable. You're like, you know, you can see, you can easily see how those things can lead to drive, but those qualities are also, um, eating disorder risk factors. And so if you start being a perfectionist with your diet and obsessing, obsessively measuring everything, um, it, it's, it's very psychologically different than if you're, a meticulous person who keeps track of how many words a day you write, right? Like Mm -hmm. when you start messing with the way you view food, which is something that innately your body knows how to do, your body knows when it's hungry and when it's full and has its needs, its vitamin and mineral needs. And like, there's an internal wisdom there that when you try to add control and, 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 um, perfectionism to it, you're, you're pulling yourself away from that body wisdom and and it, that's that can lead to like the second deadliest mental health disorder for women right behind opioid addiction is um eating disorders so it's very serious stuff and coaches often and parents um and just people in general don't often realize just how dangerous the waters are when they start tracking things and viewing food as good and bad and or saying things like clean food, toxic food, and all these kinds of things. Like they seem harmless and they can sort of be pop culture things to say and do, but they can be extremely damaging. Yeah. And, and you, you tried your damnedest too to, to lead by example. Um, even I believe it was at, at Stanford too. You were one of the top performers on your team. And you, you know, you wrote that you, you saw the disordered eating in your teammates and you wanted to be the one who would have, have that extra cookie or that extra serving and and that extra helping and and it was all well and good and then then you write just this one standalone sentence and it's like but then I stopped winning and yeah. w- and was was that a moment where you're like like oh shit is this like the start of something <laughs> yeah yeah like it's all well and good to like be like oh I'm not going to change my behavior <laughs> I'm like I feel confident that the choices I'm making are good choices because I'm still winning but yeah once you stop winning then the uh, then everything gets called into question. And then that's the first time I was subject to all the insecurities so many of my peers and teammates and competitors faced a little bit sooner than I did. It's like, how do you continue to prioritize your health and keep that big picture perspective when you're having short-term consequences or like in your performance that you feel are, or you're told to view as consequences? They're not consequences. You're just going through a period of 
adjustment to your new body. But like, that's, that's like the core of the book is how do we view, how do we create language around these normal experiences for women? We view them as, as deviating from the ideal path when the ideal path doesn't apply to us. It, we have our own ideal path that's not acknowledged. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, you write about that, you know, just normal, you know, biological development, be it, you know, menstruation, pure puberty, every other sort of, uh, uh, you know, just physical development is, um, is deemed quite literally in some cases like career ending injuries for, for quote unquote injuries for a lot of women in, in this, in this game. And it's, it's, it's really just dispiriting and sad to hear it just as a reader but i can't imagine what it's like for you know for women experiencing it it's yeah and you convey it so well yeah i think we just have to um create a new norm i mean i just think about like if you just tried to apply this to other industries like let's say that male singers at age 14 would develop like a crack in their voice for two years, which is not too much of a reach from what could happen, right? During yeah. puberty. But let's say that this was just a universal experience for half the population. And let's say that in the singing world, who got to be a singer as a professional depended on what your voice sounded like at age 14 and a half. Well, there'd be a lot like females would would not even have to deal with that. And that would be a totally fine thing for, I mean, it wouldn't be like the best way to measure a future career of a person, but it certainly wouldn't be disqualifying necessarily in the same way it would for males if they're undergoing this predictable body change, right? Kind of right at the quote, wrong time. Well, that's what sports are. Like sports rewards bodies that are in their prime at age 17, 18, which is just totally different in a female body than a male body. And then again, at 21 and 22, and which determines whether you have a pro career or not. Um, and like we, I don't know, we just need to find ways to see how absurd this would be in, in like other industries or other cultures so we can see how obvious it is that we just recognize different norms. Yeah, because you're essentially in since Title IX, like at that point, it was like, let's try to make everything let's take biology aside. Let's just try to get everybody equal. And that advanced the ball you know, to a certain point. Mm -hmm. And, and nowadays it's almost like you want to see, I don't, maybe the timeline, I don't know. Would you suggest maybe like if you could wave a wand that you would just want the timeline maybe shifted, I don't know, five years for women to get through that sort of, for lack of a better term, that dip that men don't experience. And that way it puts you on a better trajectory to be a, a pro into your prime years, whereas like men just kind of peak at a di well, not peak, but they, they hit a peak at a different time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's certain things we can't change that would be great in theory, right? Uh, at yeah. least for running. Like if you could have college be ages 22 to 26 instead of 18 to 22 yeah. college yeah. sports, that would change everything. That would change absolutely everything. Um, but we're never going to do that, right? So when it comes to college scholarships, that's always going to be an economic pressure that female athletes are going to have to contend with where, they're, with, where they and their coaches and their parents and loved ones are going to have to keep an eye out and go, hey, there's a lot on, at stake here that's going to make this young person feel they should maybe fight their body or view puberty as a negative and like that is very real. And, and, and so we have to kind of have all of our, all the lights on in the building here and make sure that we're not adding to that pressure um, or that we are expanding that athlete's options to division two, II, division three schools, club running, like making other avenues of sports participation that aren't just D1 scholarship level stuff, appealing, valid other steps on a path for their long-term career to, to take some of that pressure off. I think we could do that. There's a, a moment too in the book where it reminded me so much of the, uh, just the ethos behind it, essentially a performance enhancing drugs in baseball. Whereas mm -hmm. somebody, let's just say someone above you at, in a team or on your team, or maybe on a different team, like be a professional and you're like, Oh my God, that guy is juicing. I'm not, but shoot, if I'm going to, supplant him or even just keep up I might have to do the same thing and yep. you there's a part in the book too where you're where you where you notice that someone who's ahead of you 
you can tell just by looking at her that she's probably anorexic and you were not and you're like i can't keep up with this person right now like who would let this person do this to themselves for the just to just to be ahead and therein lies that that arms race of uh, now i might have to incur an eating disorder in order to keep pace it's like that arms race is really really toxic and dangerous yeah that's the i mean that's where coaches and administrators can make a huge difference um, because their incentives, I mean, this was kind of ties back to your previous question of like coaches in college are incentivized and rewarded based on how many points they get, where they rank in conference, where they rank at nationals. Right. And so if you're going to be punished or at least not rewarded for things like keeping your entire team healthy and everyone on the team still enjoying running throughout the process of their development, and you're instead rewarded on, on like points and rankings, then you're more likely to like overlook what may be an athlete struggling with an eating disorder who this season happens to be having a short-term performance gain from losing weight. Um, and you can overlook the fact that their bones are depleting. They probably aren't getting their menstrual cycle and they may be on their way to a lifelong struggle with food and body. Like you're just not motivated to see the things that are harder to see. And, and so I think we can do some changes there. Like I think coaches of women's sports during those developmental years, we should change the rewards. We should create a different ranking system for college programs where, you know, we have like ranked programs based on results and they need to be ranked on health and attrition rates and, um, and like, like a affinity for the sport that they came in loving yeah, or even um, you know, in uh, like injury tracking too, like you know, be it uh, bone density too, like so yeah. much of the hormonal stuff that gets interrupted through disordered eating leads to brittle skeletal structures. And I don't, it, it may sound kind of weird, but I don't know that to me strikes me as a way to be like, oh, this is a coach and a program that is that is putting the health of the actual physical athlete and by extension their mental health. Uh, far ahead of wins and losses, but that might in the end translate to more wins and losses if you can just kind of, you know, I don't know, you just have to shift that paradigm. It's, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah. It would be huge if we could. I mean, you think about all these yeah. like, ranking systems based on whatever things they decide they want to rank. Like, what is this U.S. News and World Report that ranks the best colleges in the country? Like, it's all subjective. What are they choosing to put into the equation of what makes the best school, right? And so um, if you know that huge numbers of people are being harmed in this system that should be a motivator to change the ranking system it would really empower athletes and their parents like young people and their parents to be able to create a different rubric for making their decisions about where to go next yeah early on in the book too you wrote you cite some studies about where you see basically a, a, a young women sort of leaking out of sports and organized sports. Maybe you can just like kind of talk about that a little bit and some of the reasoning or the reasons behind we see such a fall off in um, female athletic uh, participation. Yeah, well, the Women's Sports Foundation has done a lot of research into this. And there's a lot of issues that are, are like outside of puberty that affect this. Um, and people can read about that online. But it's like having... Um, role models, like we still lack role models. We still only get about four or 5% of the sports coverage for female athletes and endorsement money is 1% of all the endorsement money in sports goes to women's sports. So like we, we have like a serious inequity problem that trickles down to participation of girls growing up, believing that, that sports matter on a cultural level for them. And then there's what, how does it feel in their body? And that's what I focus on in the book is how does it feel when you are climbing a tree and running around a grass field as a child in your child body that hasn't developed yet? And then how does it feel a year later when you're developing breasts and they're sore or when you're managing cramps from a men your menstrual cycle and kind of these the mood cycle that you're getting used to for your adult female self, right? So how do we how do we think about and acknowledge that movement feels different for, for girls during that time and that they're not because it's not acknowledged, a lot of them are leaving sport. They leave at two times the rate of their male peers by age 14. By age 17, half of girls quit sport. 
to organize sport. And, um, and that's an international problem, even in countries that have great access in theory, right? Like they're just not sticking around. And so breasts are the first, the first part of development for puberty, for female puberty. And that's right around middle school age. So, uh, and half of girls don't own a sports bra at that time. And like three fourths of them have breast related concerns about exercise. So they have questions, they lack equipment. And I, I really believe that if males got breasts during middle school, there would be a standard issue sports bra in every locker alongside the jock strap. Like it would be, it would just be standard equipment. Um, and yet youth sport uniforms don't come with sports bras, at least in any place I've ever heard of. It's you get your Jersey and your shorts, just like the boys team does. And it's like, you're on your own to find a sports bra. Um, and, and that's just like, it's just such a low hanging fruit thing to keep more girls in sport. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's a, it's a, and especially in that age where, where, where kids are so, really like really cruel and mm-hmm. you know if you have a you know a, a poor you know a poor girl who's like self-conscious about her body she's running around and things aren't uh, it can be a point of ridicule and that per- that that girl but she might never turn to sports again just based on people making fun and yep. it's just like it, it's like you said it's such a low-hanging fruit such a simple thing to just you know recognize that this is a part of you know, you know, part of a body in motion. This is how we make it more comfortable <laughs> for for yeah. people and less self conscious. So then you can just manifest the best version of yourselves out there and fe- be less, you know, feel more free in your own in your own skin. Yeah, I mean that's the thing that people love about sport, right? Is that you get to feel freedom in your body and power in your body, and that's powerful for anyone. But it's especially powerful for women and girls in our culture whose bodies begin to be sexualized as soon as they hit puberty, and they begin to see themselves through their own eyes, but also through the eyes of men. And they develop this double consciousness um, as they're moving through the world. And that like the ability to, if you can keep girls in sports, you can keep them feeling good in their bodies in sport. That's a huge boost, uh, you know, for resilience to move through the world for them. But the, I say like giving a sports bra is simple, but I just like also want to point out that like a good sports bra that will adequately support a D or above chested woman or girl is expensive. I mean, they can be over a hundred dollars and like not all sports bras are equal. Yeah. You can't, an, an eight cup sports bra person that, that they're, they're going to be easier to fit and easier to help through that time with their equipment than, than another person with larger breasts. So like even people with, um, with like moderate funds can struggle to spend a hundred dollars on a sports bra and like parents are likely to um, underestimate that. Like there's a lot of cultural ceremony around the first bra, like regular bra, like it's written about in books that it's kind of a big moment when you need to buy your first bra. Um, We should have a similarly empowering, like much more empowering one around buying your first sports bra and we got to get give them get them for our girls before they actually need them like have it ready in the drawer <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah there's a there's a point in the book too where another another one of those like things that planted a very sort of uh, toxic seed in, in your head you know Paula Radcliffe is one of your one of your like idols as you were looking at someone who hit her athletic prime you know late 20s th- into her 30s doing doing amazing uh, just amazing work and you, you had noted i believe like you know she weighed a certain thing and you go in the program and then you met her and had lunch with her and you said you brought that up she's like i never weighed that much oh yeah. that little that little <laughs> and it's just like holy shit like that was like this little virus that infected you and then it wasn't even real and yeah. that put pu- that pushed you down a very i don't know just a, a destructive path to try to be like well if that's what it takes to be successful. I got to, and Paula Radcliffe is successful. I got to be like that. And it was a myth. It wasn't real. Yeah. It was never real. It was a myth. And like that example is a concrete one of like seeing someone's profile online and it has their height and weight. And I take that myth and I, it impacts my years of my life. Right. Um, and the, but that same theme happens in, women's sports and girls sports in general, like so much of what we're taught to strive for is a myth 
the, the male development linear path or that gaining weight is bad or a changing body is bad. Like there's all these myths and they caught, they are also these viruses that are infecting millions of us and changing our life course, changing the way we view ourselves, the way we fuel ourselves. I mean, I, I'm hoping that this, and it seems like it is that there, and it's different for different people, but there's like alarming things that people read in here where they go, Oh shit. Whoa. Hmm. Yeah. That happened to me. I did ingest that and take that on. And that was, that was a myth. And like, what would have been different if I hadn't done that? And then there can be like an anger that happens first, but then like a determination to stop it from happening to anybody else. And there's a, a point too in your story too, where you, you suffer a, a pretty gnarly foot injury um, and it, it puts you on the shelf and you're on the, you know, you're speaking to a doctor and he's just like, basically, you know, if you're a racehorse, you know, we'd, we'd shoot you. Like this is the kind <laughs> of <laughs> foot injury, you know, which leads to, to me, it was like the greatest, you know, it's so, it's such a subtle thing in terms of the, the writing, but to me it was like the best sentence in the whole book where you were <laughs> talking about the, you know, the, uh, of just like losing losing your space, and then you had doctor recommended surgery, and then you had about a fifty percent chance of returning to form. Then you write like I thought of the racehorses, <laughs> and I was just like total gut punch. It's like <laughs> holy shit! Like it's like your life ended. Yeah, yeah, that's I I love that. Like like that was a really satisfying chapter kicker to write. Like I was like, yep, that's exactly what needs to go there. That's going to bring home exactly what I want the reader to feel. You know, in, in that moment there there could be there could be two ways of thinking about it you could have been like truly truly despondent and sometimes that injury made a decision for you and it it put you on the shelf and maybe when you otherwise wouldn't have was was there ever any relief or was it more depression that you had to be laid up um it, it was a lot of things i mean i think at first it was relief because i'd been pushing for so hard and i'd been heartbroken again and then it, an Olympic sport athlete really only gets to rest once every four years. And it's right after either the Olympic trials or the Olympics. That's when you, that's like, you know how most people do a new year's resolution every year where they sit down and take an assessment for the Olympic sport athletes. Like every four years, there's this extra big, important one where you set up your next four years and you get to analyze all the choices you've made and you start on this next macro cycle. And so there was a relief with like, okay, I can rest now. And I have this serious injury that means I, I have to rest in a way I've never even rested before. Like I need to just sit around. Um, but then when you don't move your body and you're not around your people and depression really set in and the, just the, 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 the gravity of the heartbreak that it would take four more years in order to give it another try. And like just believing, like truly believing in my heart that I had what it took that I was that level of athlete, but I just couldn't seem to catch a break. Like I couldn't seem to do it when it mattered most. Um, so yeah, it was, it was blue. It was a blue time. Um, but then it was also a chance to kind of like reevaluate, okay, if I'm going to do this again, I'm going to do it differently. Like I'm not going to live the runner monk lifestyle. I'm not going to buy into this idea that I can only be one thing and I have to forego all other parts of my identity and self in the name of this goal, because I have done that. And it, it got me here in this wheelchair anyway. So mm -hmm. if I'm gonna spend four more years, I need to find a way to do it where it's enjoyable, where I can reconnect with some of the things that made me fall in love with the sport in the first place. What were those, the, the moments like when you felt most blue? And what was the, your self talk? How did you get yourself through it to give yourself a light at the end of the tunnel during the long rehab? Oh man, it's probably similar to what I did in the time when I was writing this book. I went through a mental health crisis of depression. I had a pretty lengthy depressive episode. And um, I think it was just like trying to reconnect with the re my reason for being and like the most important things in my life, like just really boiling them down to what are the minimum things that I need to make life worth it. Um, and so in 2008, in the the period of life you're talking about, it was like to make my running life worth it. Cause that was what I was centering. Um, like li life would follow suit if my running life was <laughs> working out. That's not how I view things anymore. Uh, but then it was 
taken some control of my story. So writing a blog really helped me get out of my depression at that time and feel like, okay, um, as a sports person, the world tells us that what you're doing matters if the media is writing about you. If they have decided, if someone else decides your story is worth telling, then you're successful. And when you write your own blog, you're like, I get to decide what moments I think are worth sharing and my audience will find me or they'll leave. And that's great. Like it just created more of an agency feeling to that. And then I could also highlight the things that I felt mattered about sport that weren't podiums, like more process driven stuff and community driven stuff. And then so once that once I decided to write that blog, then I was living my day to day life looking for those things. Where are the moments of joy? Where are the moments of community? Like, I trained my writer's eye to observe and see and feel those things more deeply, which improved my day to day experience. Yeah, and you speak of writer's eye there, and there's something to be said for, you know, as you progressed as an athlete and it transitioned more into coaching and you kind of developed that coaching eye. The I suspect that when you see somebody like a Mary Kane come along, your antenna, your spidey sense starts to tingle. Um, I I suspect you know you see you see it quite frequently. So when you see the a Mary Kane, the the archetype of a Mary Kane who is you know super young, super precocious runner, it, you know make make the, make the turn and you start seeing things. You know what are you seeing and is it uh, is it improving at all? Uh, no, it's not improving. And like, there's nothing more frightening to me than a female phenom, a young female phenom mm -hmm. um, in sport, because it just when you understand female physiology, there, it's like that voice changing in, as a male singer thing, like I know what's going to happen. And so then the question is, what will the environment be like for this person when it happens? Who is in their corner? who's in their ear, right? And like, what's their financial stability situation like? Can their environment, like, can they ride through this to get out the other side? Since structurally and institutionally, we haven't built anything to do that. It's really up to like, whatever random people are in their corner. And that's just, that's just too, um, that's leaving too much up to chance. And that's why I really advocate for structural reforms and best practices wherever we can put them like we did have done with concussion policy, like we need to formalize best practices, take it, take a lot of decisions out of individual coaches hands, we shouldn't have individual coaches deciding when someone's sick enough with an eating disorder to get them help. Like they're, th those things should be standardized, because we know how how grave they can be. And so yeah, it's hard, it's hard to watch. It's hard for me to feel enthusiasm when I see a young girl kicking butt in sport. And it's sometimes the athlete also, and it goes back to what you were saying about the that Venn diagram of disordered eating comes comes down. One of those traits is being like people pleaser, being coachable. An athlete can be, uh, you know, he, she, or their own worst enemy. It's a lot of football players getting their quote bell rung, and they don't want they want to get back out there. And yep. you name yep. it, fill in your f sport and injury. So it's, yeah, it's like, but if there are protocols in place, you can. You know, remove the re take that decision out of their hands because you know because uh, how they're wired you know no pain no gain it's it, yep. they're gonna they're gonna want to keep competing even if it's at their own detriment. Well, and that's why this and I know we're running low on time now, but like why Simone Biles' story was so important for me to put in the book because yeah. Simone was when Simone decided not to do. Um, one of the events at the Olympic Games because of mental health. Like, hey, I'm not feeling like I'm mentally in a place to do this high risk activity where I can break all my bones and snap my neck. Like, I need to, I'm the one that can decide and must decide when it's safe to do so. And I'm deciding it's not and I'm not going to do it. Like, that's something that no gymnast could have done 15 years earlier, like under Bella Caroli. Like, that was not an environment that permitted such things. Um, and so, yes, there's going to be those kinds of athletes that are like, not going to, they're going to be their own worst enemy and they're not going to uh, advocate for themselves. But part of that is because we haven't been shown cultural examples of the most successful people making different choices. And so the Simone story needs to be like far and wide or like Naomi Osaka saying, I'm not going to do a press conference. Uh, before this tennis tournament, which she was deeply criticized for and financially penalized for, but it wasn't good for her mental health. And she was just like, I'm not doing it. Um, and we need athletes to like 
see those examples and go, oh, <laughs> it is my body. I am in the end the one that that can like decide on a lot of this stuff. And like health is more important than any trophy or medal or whatever. And then we need to bolster the institutions to make those choices easier too with policies, but also like league minimum salaries can be helpful. Things that take the heat off economically for people, like in mm. track and field, I mean, there are no league minimums. There is no health insurance. There's no benefits, right? So everything is on the line at all times. So it's like an environment like that makes it much harder to flex your agency and protect yourself. Well, very nice. Well, Lauren, there's always one question I like to end these conversations with, and it's just asking you as the guest for a recommendation for the listeners out there. And that can be anything uh, for a, to, from a book to a brand of coffee you're inspired by. Uh, it's, a, it's always up to you. So I'd extend that to you as we bring this conversation down for a landing. Oh, yeah. Well, there's two things. Um, one is my friend Lori Wagner's uh, 27 Powers Wild Writing stuff. She's got a whole community. She's got workshops. They're very affordable. And that work was has been incredibly useful for me to be able to write more honestly. Um, and the book would not have been what it was without the, the years that I spent doing Lori's work. And then the other thing is just Jennifer Loudon's coaching. I mean, she's a phenomenal coach. If there's If you have a project that you're really needing to, you're needing to get done, but you're having trouble like breaking it into smaller parts. Um, she's so experienced and so motivated. And that's only one of many things she does, but she's just an excellent book coach. Well, fantastic. Well, Lauren, thank you so much for carving the time to come over and talk shop, but also talk about this important uh, memoir slash manifesto that you've written that I, that I hope really moves us in that direction that where it truly Im- it puts a greater sense of attention and empowerment and where, where it belongs. So I just got to commend you on a job well done. And I, I eagerly hope in a, that it'll, that'll do what you set out to do. Thank you. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to talk to you. And, and it's a real pleasure to talk about the craft as well. You know, the craft and the content together. It's not something that I get to do often. So thanks for the time. All right. All right. Man, that was great. Nice to give Lauren other things to talk about besides running and the book itself. That's always the balance between having a conversation surrounded by content and craft. You want to honor the book at hand, but you also want to dig into how it comes to be, how they go about it. Good stuff. Thanks for listening and making it this far, CNFers. If you liked what you heard, don't be shy. Share this across your networks, link up to the show on social, spread it hand to hand, tag it at CNF Pod on Twitter or at Creative Nonfiction Podcast on Instagram. I'll be sure to just give you a little, uh, I don't know, it de- depends. If it's something I like, you might just get a James Hetfield gif and you're, you just look out, you don't know. You know, early 90s, James Hetfield, you know, to me is like, Apex Hetfield. All right. Uh, consider subscribing to my monthly newsletter, book recommendations, links to helpful and inspiring articles, an exclusive happy hour. That's how we rage against the algorithm. Check out patreon.com slash CNF pod. Shop around. See if you want to support the show with a few bucks to help offset the costs. Show is free, but as you know, it sure as hell ain't cheap. So for, for the few of you who may listen this far and want updates or news about what's going on at CNF Pod HQ, and specifically yours truly. I had my meeting with the Harper Collins editor and my agent uh, today. I'm recording this on a Thursday. You are listening to this at earliest, Friday the 20th. We had a 75-minute conversation. Yeah, never having been in one of these meetings in my life... I think it went all right. I think it went well. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> did, did it go that well that you had to cough up something in your throat as you said those words? I, I've, I've gotten my hopes up in the past about various things, and it always, well, let's just say it usually leads to disappointment. When it comes to the matter of art and subjectivity, you're best to just be happy you're in the room. I guess if you were nominated for like an Oscar or something, I, I think you just need to just celebrate the fact that you were even nominated because you can't control anything. And who the hell knows? You might 
happened to be up against Daniel Day-Lewis that year, and, well, you're kind of fucked. Uh, so you can't hope to win, but the, the fact that you're even on that stage and in the room and being nominated, that that's a win. You have to rewire your brain to think that way. I think it's healthy to think that way. Got me thinking about this long road to getting in this particular room. Here I am, 42 years old. 42 and a half. Okay, so this podcast will turn 10 in two months. 10 fucking years. With six of those years, the last six, being pretty damn strict about one podcast a week. And it was through this show that I've met a lot of great people. You know, one of those people put me in touch with an agent who liked my memoir but wanted to do something more commercial first. Hence this book proposal journey that's been going on for a year at this point. And how lucky I feel, you know? It just, luck has a lot to do with it, but I think it's something like, some situation like this, it's a bit more common than maybe we'd like to admit. Like through your body of work, you might meet the right people. And I meet a lot of people as a result of this uh, this show. And soon that network, in a way, starts working for you and opens up a door or two and gets you in a room you should never have been invited in. You know, we harbor hopes, I guess, of rising out of the slush pile. It feels like you did it on your own merits. You didn't need anyone else's help. You, your own talent, your own ability got you into the room, out of the pile. Representation, publication, you name it. But I'd wager that the people and writers we've long admired had a leg up in a way that maybe I had a leg up to get in this room. You just don't hear about it very often. So I like I like being forthcoming with that kind of thing. You know, any any degree of privilege that I might have, like, for instance, and I've mentioned this before, but for anyone who doesn't know, like, I'm not I am not the breadwinner in the family. My wife makes a healthy salary from a job that's killing her, but she has the health insurance and the steady paycheck allows me more wiggle room to still lean into this and to pursue freelance opportunities and to not have the pressure of having to earn that steady paycheck to keep the to keep the lights on. You know, she does that. That is a gift. That is a big gift, maybe the biggest. And so I, I like to recognize that in any case. And it was so it was a little listen, uh you know, nothing might come of this meeting and how I got into this room based on the 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 merits of this show and the people that it put me in touch with. I only earn this leg up by putting this podcast out every week for years and years and trying my best to serve this community as best I can. And that community put some wind in my sails. I guess all of this is to say that we need to keep making stuff, making a ruckus, as Seth Godin might say, serving the community. We've chosen to help, and maybe that well, that boomerang will just kind of circle back and land in our hand and be like, oh, damn, that's nice. But that can't be the reason you do it. You know what I mean? I think early on I had these hopes that by if I uh, if I did this thing where I was like celebrating people's work, then I, then I might get some sort of karmic boost. But that's the wrong way to think about it. It's got to be genuine. And I like to think I've grown into that kind of advocate over the years. Uh, you know, win or, win or lose, you know, I'll keep doing my thing here because that's what we do. And if you can't do, well, shit. Interview. See ya. <laughs>